how can you do all that needs done in life and still pursue your desire to learn French or the guitar or grow a plant or make art? You can't put a fiddle under your pillow and wake up playing it, though how cool would that be? But one thing we can do, no matter how chaotic and overwhelming life can be, is know that every tiny small motion in the direction of those endeavors really do matter. And not only that, they add up over time with great momentum. Join me, Annie Fane Barillon, as I interview painters and gardeners, designers and musicians, photographers and cooks, creative livers of any kind, who have somehow, in the middle of it all, continued on their creative paths, no matter what. This is Fane House Radio, and I'm so glad you're here. My name is Kelsey Loomer. I grew up with a really creative family, so... Creativity has been part of my life forever. I think like the first that really comes to mind is building forts and being in the woods with some of my best friends when I was little. I had a, a dear friend who in second grade, we had, the, we had a little ceramic skunk and a pencil topper frog and we created this whole world around froggy and skunky and it became this like epic thing and this land and this whole story and and then we would build them houses in the woods and I think about that a lot when I'm working these days it's like a mindset I dabble in a lot of different art I'm creatively restless, maybe. I've studied a lot of, I've done, I studied printmaking in college and book arts. I love writing all the ways that one lives in the world. I think that it's hard to like pin down one creative thing because it's like singing in your car and sitting in the woods. <laughs> but yeah, I think the main theme, it's been woven throughout I didn't have like a career before I, before what I'm doing now, I didn't have, you know, I wasn't a nurse or a doctor before this. I was working some day jobs. I worked in an art store and, you know, but really it's just been the art all along. I love hearing about Froggy and Skunky because <laughs> imagining creating the world in the woods with them people go, which I hope they do, go look at your paintings and your line of jewelry. You can see some froggy and skunky in the woods inside of that. <laughs> like super nature inspired and dreamland feeling. I've actually had a thought of like, what if they actually showed up in some of my paintings? The froggy and skunky. <laughs> but I think that the essence of that time of my life still is so impactful to me. And yeah, I think it does show up in my work. I grew up without a TV, so I was also a pretty dorky child. A dorky might not be the right word, but uh, I spent a lot of time with my best friend in the woods and reading books. It was pretty much just my whole childhood when I wasn't in school. So, And it is a really cool thing because that was you practicing getting in flow or practicing getting in the zone. And that's like a big part of what all creativity is in any form is just getting into that place in your brain. And so when we're having a hard time or stuck, it's because we can't get in there. You know, we want our kids to know how to get in that place in their head. Yeah, people ask me all the time, like, where's your creativity from? Or where do you, you know, where did this come from? When did you study? And I did study art in school and I have, you know, taken classes and I'm not specifically a formally trained artist, but I feel like, yeah, the best gift has been that, the flow and the, the connection, it just feels like so much more valuable to what I'm doing right now than a specific formal thing. That has been a huge gift. Contrary to what some folks think, <laughs> growing a small business is a long haul. You know, you might look on Instagram, Facebook and be like, oh my gosh, poof, they're famous. But there's so much time behind the scenes that's happening. You're about 10 years ish in. You also have an interesting twist in your story, which is that you started with one business with things you knew would sell that was your artwork. And then that kind of fed you into a place where you could then just go paint maybe what you wanted to paint. Tell us about that journey. Yeah. So I wish that it had a little more discipline before I had kids. I think I just 
from the time I graduated college, I was painting and printmaking and I was making handmade books. And as far as like making money from them, I would make a little money and then I'd be moving on to the next thing. And I, I just like wasn't really grounded in it. I wouldn't describe myself as this successful artist. I was being creative, but not so much in a financial sense. And then after I had my first child, I realized how precious that I just, you know, you look back and you're like, what was I doing with all that time? I really buckled down when they were little and I started painting and I started selling my paintings and it was really awesome. And then I got to this place pretty quickly where I would have a painting. I could take it in two directions and like one was like following my heart and it wasn't always this like pretty put together thing it was like more explorative and could be weird or just I don't know it just was like un unknown or I could take it into a place where I know it'd be more palatable just for the general people that were buying my paintings at the time and I just started to have a lot of anxiety about it and so I set out and created our jewelry business or my jewelry business at the time later my husband joined me in it but I created Seed in Sky, my jewelry business, so that it was based more on my illustrative work. I felt comfortable creating the images sort of for other people and that it was specifically to bring in an income for my family. And my idea at the time was I'm going to whip up this little business and then in a year or two, I'm going to start like really just be able to be creative however I want and explore that. And then I'll have this income generating artistic business here. And then I'm going <laughs> to, that was 11 years ago. Yeah. It took a long time to get it going and I never really stopped painting, but it was very sporadic. The jewelry really took almost all of my free time and energy that I had. We had a lot of other life things going on at the time we were building a house and gardening and kind of homesteading and having little kids and and my husband was working out of the house at the time so I would so there was a lot going on it makes sense now like of course it took all those years to get it started you know unrealistically was thinking I could just do that really fast and then move on but it ended up being a really amazing gift and that it really taught me a lot about just dedication and persistence. And this jewelry business has been a real interesting plot twist, I feel like, of my life because I'm not a jeweler and yet I own a jewelry business. Because somebody sometimes will say, what do you do? And I say, well, I, I own a jewelry business. <laughs> I mean, lately I've been saying I'm a painter more than that, but I was, so I own a jewelry business. And then I just like, there's this whole part of me that's like, I'm not a jeweler. <laughs> because the jewelry is all little prints. It's like, for me, it's about the artwork inside the jewelry and the jewelry is just the vehicle and a really tangible way for people to buy, hold, connect to my art in, you know, and they're just miniature little pieces of art. Yeah, but it took a really long time and it was, but also just feel so grateful because I was able to stay home with my kids and create the life I wanted to live. Yeah, it was really, really satisfying. And then now, and then Alex, my husband joined me pretty early on. I think it was a few years into it. He brought the gift of being a little bit more business savvy. And so that was a big gift for the jewelry business. We took a couple of business classes along the way that really helped out. It grew to the point where it was our sole income. And then at some point a few years ago, I started stepping away more from it so that I, so I could start painting. And so now it really depends on the season, like the holiday season, I'm full on seed and sky. The rest of the year, I'm probably working on seed and sky, like 10 hours a week. And I'm painting, you know, 20 to 30 hours a week, which kind of blows my mind. It's been really, it's really amazing for me. Well, and you have that huge level of gratefulness because you haven't always had that. And that's so cool too, because it was almost like what you're describing with Seed and Sky was also like your small business training program, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> then when you come out of that, you're able to share with your paintings in a different way. You can put them out in a different way because of what you learned with yeah. Seed and Sky. And that is special to have some flow of income while you're trying to build. It's, it's very hard to just sell paintings and live off of that. 
I mean, I'm there with you trying and it is a long haul, you know, and the gift cards and the Gicle prints end up being a sweet spot. It's fun to hear about that because you have to be dedicated and stick with it and go through all the painful parts to get there. It's not like you woke up one day and ta-da, look at me. I have a business with my husband <laughs> and we get along all the time, I'm sure. And it's all perfect. <laughs> well, probably not. There's all this stuff in there, right? And then the time that went and then all you had to go through by yourself with kids and gardening and homesteading and doing this business, that is not easy. So through that, then you kind of got to, the beauty of it was eventually being able to do that with him. And But it's not. it doesn't just poof. No, that first year when he joined me, we just don't really bicker much in general, but that was like, no bickery, but just con the conflict for like six months after he stopped working and jumped in and I had to let go of so much control. One of the biggest things was he wanted me to raise the prices. It was a real edge for me. I just, I mean, now it just seems so silly, but like, I, I think I was selling the earrings for like $20 and he was like, no, they need to be at least 30. You know, here's why, blah, 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 blah. You're just not valuing yourself. I was like, I just want to do this quick. I want it to sell fast. I want to move on. I want to get to my painting. <laughs> and he was like, no, like you have to value yourself more. It was a real struggle at first to figure out. We were just around each other all the time. You know, our house was 650 square feet. And then at some point we, we hired some friends to come in and help us. And that was a big step. Our office was in our bedroom. It was just like all big one upstairs room. I mean, it wasn't big. It was like 200 square feet. We had like a loft for the kids. And then we would set up these folding tables. And everyone would have to like shuffle sideways to like sit down at the chair. I mean, it was ridiculous. And then the kids would be playing. It was really chaotic. <laughs> it totally worked. I mean, it was great at this, you know, have fond memories. At the time I felt kind of claustrophobic. And that shows real determination. Yeah. I like to think that. And now you're at the point, because I, of course, have to research you a little bit more before asking questions. You have over 12,000 sales on your Seed and Sky Etsy shop. And I know there are plenty of folks listening who might have their own Etsy shop or are thinking about these things um, who would love to know how you did that. I know that's a loaded question because there's not just an answer. But is there anything you kind of like learned through time that you think helped or did it help to be part of Etsy in the earlier days and how it's grown and shifted or... Yeah, I think it's a multifaceted thing, but right off the bat, I started doing craft shows. We are not doing craft shows this year, which has been a big shift, but up until COVID, we were doing like 25 shows a year and traveling kind of around the Southeast. I think that that really was one of the main ways that we really spread you know, we were giving out business cards and making sales and we'd have repeat customers coming back to our Etsy store. We're in the, currently building an e-commerce site on our website, but up until now, or even right now, we only have Etsy as our, as our e-commerce. I think that was one way that helped spread. It wasn't just Etsy. We were bringing people into Etsy. I think it probably did help being on Etsy earlier. You know, a lot of people grumble about Etsy and I've definitely done my fair share of that, but I also feel like it's been really amazing for us and for our business. And I just, especially when we lived out in the middle of nowhere, it was amazing to be able to have this platform where you post your thing and, and then it's, you're selling it. And I'd walk to the mailbox and put it in the mailbox. And yeah, it was such a gift. I think Etsy is one of those things. It's just frustrating. It's just like, it just takes work. It's like, you have to keep, you just have to keep touching the shop. You can't just like post your things. As soon as like, we stop as soon as our sales start dropping, it's like, yeah, we haven't touched the shop. We haven't, you know, it's like even just like going in and like rearranging your items or adding, you know, there was a certain point where I think I got to like 80 items that there was a big shift. So I think sometimes having more items for sale is just a bigger reach. We started paying for ads at some, you know, it's shifted so much over the years. Like there was this one time where there was this group where you could like other people's things and they would like yours and then it generated it was like this ridiculous like algorithm thing that people were trying to beat and like I joined that and I would spend like half an hour a day liking other people it was ridiculous but little things like that I think that I wouldn't necessarily recommend that but I would say that persistence and just not it I don't think that Etsy is necessarily I mean maybe if you have something very specific but I think it's a platform where you really need to be integrated into it and to be working on it and constant, you know, I still, my shop, there's so much I could do to improve my photo. You know, it's just like, it's just a never ending 
wheel of you really could improve this or you know sometimes I'll look and my banner has said I'm out of the shop until May <laughs> it's already August and like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> that's always happening so like I think there's just an endless amount of energy you could give it I think it pays off I mean it's paid off for us so one big thing you're saying which I think is really true is that is about you being out and about and bringing people to your shop it doesn't work to just let, just let it lie and, you know, let it be found within all the <laughs> cabillions of Etsy shops. You know, I, I hear you there. Yeah. And then also like this never endingness of, well, you could do links between your, you know, listings and you could have this, you could have that. And yes, did you turn off and turn on vacation mode and forget, or, you know, the quality of your images. And, and I think that makes sense too, what you're saying about maybe having a larger, you know, having a, larger quantity of items could have an impact because you just have, it also gives you this fuller look and a more professional look too. And it is very cool. Like you're saying, there are things to grumble about, but really in the end, if you're putting this constant kind of regular, consistent energy over time, something's going to happen. Something, not nothing. Not nothing. <laughs> right. You and I, hardly know each other. I feel like we kind of do know each other, which is funny, but it's, it's also clear we share this uh, similar language in our paintings. And we're even drinking out of the same mugs right now for anybody watching the video. East Fork, shout out. Exactly the same color. I think they are. Yay. Totally. Yes. <laughs> that is so funny. It's and it's kind of an impossible question to ask in a way, because of course, everybody asks, you know, people ask me and they're asking you, like, where does your inspiration come from? I've had people say like, what's in your head? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I could take it this direction or I could take that that direction. <laughs> what's going on in there? You know, what is happening? Uh huh. So do you have a answer to that? Yeah. I mean, well, I have different things, things like the images for seed and sky or illustrative or when I was doing more making, those things would start out with an idea, with a very specific idea, and I would have it in my head and maybe sketch it out. And those inspirations are often things that I'm drawn to, nature and beautiful patterns and things like that. My paintings that I'm working on the last couple of years, or just like my more um, expressive paintings, the ideas also come from that, but then there's like this added layer of, yeah, it's like what's in my head. So sometimes it's a feeling, you know, a lot of my paintings are about love or grief or a specific thing that's even happening either in my day or my world that sort of starts getting worked out on the painting. It, it's not a formulated thing. It just like starts coming in. And then there's sometimes personal symbols or archetypal symbols or things that I bring in that represent things to me or to the world at large. I have a lot of paintings about my grandparents and it's just very loose, loosely. Like somebody, I, I hesitate when some, you know, I have a lot of people coming into my studio and asking me like, what does this painting mean? Or where did this come from? And a lot of, I feel like my best paintings, I don't really know. There's just a mystery about it. And I'll, I could point to certain parts of the painting, you know, a lot of times Lately, I've been painting these braids in my painting. They're kind of abstracted, looping through. And for me, like that, I think is about connection and intention. It's almost like an umbilical cord or like a, like a very intentional, loving connection between things and how making connections. And, but that's just for me, you know, but other people will see it and think of something else. And I, I feel like that's really the magic of art and of painting for me is having somebody else come in and experience a painting of mine and really connect with it and have a completely different, you know, a painting could be for me about my grandmother and then somebody else comes in and has this totally different experience with it. And it means something to them. And the ideas that brought the painting to life. I mean, I feel like I love it when 
it reaches more than just my own personal idea or the story or whatever that kind of unfolded in the painting and it reaches somebody else in a deeper way and speaks to them and that kind of feels like magic like sometimes I'll paint a painting and I don't know where it, like there'll be certain images that are more you know and I love luna moths and there'll be a luna moth in there and, and it has sort of some different meanings for me ultimately it's like I just am really drawn to to those creatures and but somebody else will come in and have this whole story about how all the elements in the painting mean something specific to them. And sometimes those stories, they'll tell me them. And it's like, I feel like that painting was meant for you. <laughs> it started out as one thing, but then it feels like, I don't know, maybe I painted that painting for that person. Like, I don't even know. It just, there's some kind of mystery involved in it where it feels exciting because there's so much unknown. And I'm painting a painting right now. And I just know that I'm going to get asked again and again, like, what, what's happening here? Like, what, is, what does this mean? You know, cause it's, and it's all these images and some of the things are just things that have been happening throughout my day that it's almost like a dream, like the way a dream unfolds, it's happening in real time and it's unfolding. And then at the end, sometimes it feels like it makes sense of my world. And then my ultimate dream is that it also makes sense that I'm not just in a little vacuum, my own vacuum, but that I'm giving voice to something that's happening in my world that is larger than me. I would love it if it's not just for me <laughs> or just like, or just my own. And then maybe if it is like, and that's what my work is, is just express myself then and just my weird way of processing this human life, then maybe that is enough. I don't know. Like, I'd like to think it's a little bit bigger than that. Well, it's like a form of pure communication without words or something. Yeah. And then the people that walk by and it speaks to them, well, that secret language communicated just to them, you know, or to certain people that become the ones that want to have your art around them. And it's yeah. a really cool idea. And it does feel a little mystical because it's not about all the words and things. And like you're saying, you might be shifting and changing as you go, or if you're the way you're describing like a dream in real time. I think there's some magic in there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It makes me think about this is why the value of the art isn't in the number of hours and minutes it took to do it or, you know, your materials. It's what you're paying for is like some essence of that person's filter that they put on the page or that they put on the canvas. And that's where the value is, you know, because no one else could create that like that. Yeah. So you're getting a little piece of that person in a nice way, or just their filter through their filter. I always think about when I'm have a booth set up at a show or something like you're saying, some people walk right by, don't really glance and other people they're like, oh my gosh. And they are pulled by this invisible force into the booth. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure that happens with you. It's like, those are the people that they just get what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I think they said, you know, it's like, it's taken me a long time. I don't know if I'm like a people pleaser at heart with my family origin or what, but like there was a time where I wanted everyone to love what I was doing, you know, or just feel like exactly at my studio, people walk right by. You can see they don't even, it's like, or it's just not reaching them in a way that is for them. And I just, I don't feel affected by it at all anymore because number one, I feel affected by it. So that's really ultimately what my art is about right now is truly sinking into what, like trying to embody what to just to be myself in that space and to be authentic, but that, yeah, the people that walk by and are stopped in their tracks and are blown away. I mean, it's just like, it kind of blows me away. Like when somebody, all of a sudden somebody will be in my studio and you can just see it in their eyes. They're connecting, they're getting it in a way that I feel, or maybe it's different. I don't know, but they're, they're feeling something, you know, that's, really deep and they're really moved by my painting sometimes by the colors or or by the jewelry it's like both sometimes it's both but usually it's one or the other but yeah it's not for everybody and I, I don't really think it should be I think there's so many different ways of being creative that speak to people you know there's different kinds of music and different kinds of art and different kinds of just ways of being that we're all so unique and yet there are these threads that people connect to and, and reaches people well, I can say even just seeing your Instagram feed and your art, what you're working on right now, that's what me calling you and asking to interview you was based on was your art. 
So it's out there and subtly and small and big ways shifting your life too. And then that just shifted my life here. We're sitting here, you know, it's a fun thing to think about. It takes a lot of courage to choose the creative life and to be your own boss and work with your partner because it's not easy. Just, it's just not going to be, they'll have, it's mixed in with a lot of sweet spots too, I'm sure. Where do you think that courage comes from? For some people, it's very important, like have a job that has a dependable, consistent income, you know, has health insurance, has a boss that just kind of takes that responsibility. And that is fine. That is what is best for some people. And then to choose this, it's like, you don't know at the beginning how it's going to go. You don't know how income is different by month, you know, and it's like taking a leap, a little bit of a leap, big leap. Yeah. I think that I've, I don't know if it's a character flaw or just a, or like a character superpower, but I have never wanted to follow, like I've always wanted to follow my heart in every endeavor. Like it's to the point where it's kind of ridiculous sometimes, but I just have this innate need to follow that. And so I feel like there's just been times where I just have to, money isn't the the number one thing. Like obviously things change when you have a family, we have a mortgage now, and you know, it is, it can be scary. For a long time, we lived very, very simply in order to make it work. And that was a priority for me. It didn't really feel, I mean, I I see why it is courageous. It didn't really feel courageous. It just felt like a necessity going and getting a job that I wasn't passionate about just makes me feel trap. It just feels like a cage if I'm not really fully in. I had an experience that shifted me even further, I guess, along the courageous path. Four years ago, my dad died. He died in in a way that was kind of traumatic for me, which was that we were chatting on the phone and he unexpectedly died. It was a really dark, hard time of my life, both for the, from the trauma and from just the grief of it. I feel like that was the spark for me of what unfolded afterwards of like really getting me to, to stop, to take the leap from really being focused on seed and sky and just dabbling in what my like ultimate full on true heart wanted to be doing. And part of it was born out of necessity in that in that time period after he died, I, the art saved me. I mean, well, that and my family and my husband and a good therapist, but besides those things, the art was what drew me into myself and helped process some of the trauma. And that's when I got a studio in the River Arts District was right around that time that he passed. And I just started painting like my life kind of depended on it. And it kind of felt like it did, like it just was what I needed to be doing. And I would just, I had this, I was in a loft in in somebody else's studio that first year. And I would just sit up in this loft where no one could see me and I would paint and cry and paint. I just like worked out so much. And then when I sort of came emerging from that situation, I mean, I'm never fully emerged. It's definitely part of my life now, but I don't know if it was a courage, but it just it set a fire in me that I didn't want to go back to just not being courageous. Like it felt like life is short and this is really how I want to be spending my time and I need to do it. You know, it's still hard. Like I still find myself, even it's like the same thing as before I started painting where I, I've been painting landscapes lately sometimes and they sell really easily and people love them and they are unique in my own sense. They're my landscape, but like, they're kind of more of a palette cleanser, but they're not really what, and so there's always this part of me is like, is the courageous thing to do to, to not focus on that body of work at all. And to just focus on this other artwork that doesn't speak to nearly as many people, honestly. It's not, it's just weirder. It's not, it's like more explorative. It's just not for everyone. Whereas my landscapes, you know, everyone can get down with a good landscape. It's like, we love the natural world and you love to be able to see that in your home and peaceful. And so I feel like there is a place for that, but I guess my current edge of what is courageous look like, or is the courageous that like, no, you are already being courageous. You have all these creative endeavors you are paying the mortgage and taking care of your children by this. It's not a bad thing to be painting the landscapes. 
or is the courage to fully let go and to just dive in wholeheartedly? I don't know. I don't really have an answer for that, but I do feel like something happened with my dad's passing that shifted a courageous edge for me. I don't know if he gave me that gift, but that was a, a mm-hmm. one of the blessings of that sort of really dark time. It's almost like a true clarity feeling. Mm-hmm. That is amazing too, what you're talking about, like painting and crying and painting and crying. And to me, that's like you jumping into and facing all the feelings you were feeling right, right there with yourself and not avoiding it. (laughs) But that doesn't necessarily feel good all the time though. It's interesting too, what you're saying about like, what is courageous and not, and is it more courageous not to have a bread and butter or is that taking away something that's making your life a little easier so that you can still be here? Is it more courageous to make our lives harder or easier? I don't know. It's interesting loop to be in. Yeah. And there's a lot of time when you're painting, you know, I have a lot of time to think because you're just painting. So like when I'm painting, I just, it's a meditative state and ideally you're in the flow. And there's just a lot of time to think through some of those things. Like sometimes I just have to set it down because I just get in a loop, you know, like what is, you know, you already have so much going on. Like what, and I just really am always trying to be in the present moment with the painting or with my jewelry or, and not be thinking too much ahead because it it can really get you down. It can really start to like get confusing pretty quick. And it's a lot of pressure on ourselves to know the answers to everything. (laughs) I mean, it sounds silly to say it that simply when it comes out of my mouth, that sounds silly, but I feel like we are putting pressure on ourselves to know the answers to every single thing. What are we supposed to do? What's best for our kids? What's this, the state of the world? We just don't really know at all. And it's so hard to hang out in that place. Yeah. Do you struggle with all those things too? Like the, you mean debating in my head about, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) well, like you're saying, when I'm painting, you have these options, right? You can be in silence and be in your head and that can be uh, healing and beautiful. And it can keep you in the moment in terms of what to paint and do next. And then sometimes, like you're saying, I feel like I get in a loop that's not a good loop. My brain isn't designed for happiness. You know, it's designed for survival. And maybe I don't need to listen to my brain for a minute. And so sometimes music or a podcast or a book on tape is a way to to be in the moment, you know, to stop the loop. Um, And of course, taking a walk and things like that. But you're right. When we paint, it's hours and hours and hours. Sometimes I wonder about the physicalness of it to be like, sitting and leaning forward for that long. And then I do a lot with like a little brush. So I'm holding tightly with this hand for hours. Yeah. (laughs) Do you stand when you paint or do you move around or how do you deal with the physical side of it? I go to a chiropractor and lately I've been painting bigger, which is a new, relatively new thing. I always had really tiny studios that were like six feet by six feet. And so my paintings for a long time were pretty small. And now that I have a bigger studio, I've been exploring painting bigger paintings. So I have been standing for that, which is, or like sitting at a stool, but I'm like moving around a lot. But when I'm painting smaller paintings, either for seed and sky or for just a smaller painting or building jewelry, it's, um, yeah, it's a lot of pressure on your neck. And you know, I have this like one spot in my neck shoulder that's like constantly tight. And it's, I've done some physical therapy you know, exercises. And I got a, an Apple watch recently. So that basically telling me to get up and stand, I bought it for that reason that to like remind me to get out of, cause I can just hyper-focus. Oh yeah. It'll be like two hours. I haven't gone pee. I haven't let, you know, I haven't moved from this one spot where I've got this yeah, tiny little brush and I'm so in the zone, but then, yeah. you know, you get up and you're like, Oh, it was not, good. It was not good for my body. <laughs> yeah. I think just reminding myself to take a break too, to go for a walk. And so I'm in the River Arts District studios in Asheville. And I am in this building with all of these creative people. Lately, it's been really nice. Instead of when I had my home, when I had home studio, I would get up and like make some tea or put the laundry in. All of a sudden I'm doing dishes and I'm like, I, you know, I don't even know, but like all of a sudden an hour's passed and you're like, ah, but in my studio, I will take a break and just go walk through the building. And 
you know, I can just kind of peek in the studios and see what everyone's working on. And, you know, it'd be like a five or 10 minute walk that I'll just kind of walk around and then come back. I just feel like infused with everyone's creative energy and just some clearing of my body and my head. And that's been really, really fun to be around other creative people and to be able to just have that, to move my body, but also just to be in a different space where, and then I'm also not doing laundry and Right. I'm just there. Like I'm just there to, to do work. And it must be so validating to, to be like, you can feel through the walls, other people doing real work, their work that they are meant to do. And you are there doing your work you're meant to do. Cause I mean, that's another thing that we question is, is it selfish to make art, you know, all that kind of stuff and a hesitancy to take ourselves that seriously or the worth question. Like you're saying, I'm imagining that feeling of being, I had a studio in the river arts district, but it was years ago, many years ago, but I loved so much the feeling of other people. We weren't talking to each other. We were in our studios, but you could just feel it. Like it's okay to be here. It's okay. To take yourself seriously. They're doing it too. We're all rubbing off on each other. You know, do you feel like that a little bit? Yeah, a lot, a lot of it. Yeah. It feels like, I don't know if it's courage, but it's just like, I'm here. I'm showing up. All these other people are showing up. Yeah. I mean, don't take yourself so seriously and also take yourself seriously. Do the work, show up for yourself, just show up in this world and don't be afraid to be yourself and to put your work out there. Yeah. And to have other people to see you're not alone. There's other people doing their work. What is filling up your inspiration cup these days? Gosh, I mean, my kids always, my family, my kids. Music is like a huge deal to me. I'm not a musician. I wish, I wish I was a musician. I'm not. And I guess I sing some, but I listen to music all day long, but sometimes podcasts, I really love a good art podcast, especially when they're talking like real details about the way the brush moves along the page, like the texture, like real specific details. Like I really love that kind of podcast where they're really technical people talking about paints and stuff, but music, music's really where it's at for me, especially in combination with painting. I guess that's another thing that inspires my painting is a lot of times, sometimes I feel like like I'll get stuck on a certain song and all of a sudden I'm like listening to, I hope, and that's when I'm hoping my studio neighbors are not around because sometimes one song will just hit me in a way and all of a sudden I'm listening to it on repeat and this the painting all of a sudden is somehow in collaboration with the song so there's certain paintings I can look on and feel like there's that song and to me it feels like I can remember exactly what song was the main backdrop of that painting and it really just fills me in a way I always feel like I should I, I never have reached out to any artists but part of me was like especially if there's like one musician or one song that really brought to life a painting I always feel like it was a collaboration between me and that artist but <laughs> they don't know <laughs> like maybe my painting could inspire a song someday or maybe it comes full circle and that's like the creative life it's all growing from one place to another I don't know mm-hmm. It would be such a honor and compliment to any musician or singer to know (laughs) that someone out there had their song on repeat and painted to it. I mean, that's a compliment. I do that too, where I'll do things on repeat and repeat and repeat and hope nobody else is around (laughs) to drive them crazy. Um, Like break the world into people that do that and people that don't like, yeah, that is insane. Like that's like (laughs) insane is not the right word, but like, yeah, that, that. (laughs) It's another funny thing that we have in common accidentally. I even have one where if I am having a hard time getting in the zone, if I play that one song, I can get right in there. Yeah. And it's a tool kind of like you're saying, it's a tool for you. Yeah. And it's like the repetitiveness of it. I mean, I know it would drive some people totally up the wall, but the repetitiveness or sometimes the lyrics, it's like, there is something about it, the secular emotion of it and the chords and the, just like, there's something that happens that yeah, it like loops around and it, it's like a whole embodiment. Like you can just feel it. And then the painting also sort of takes on that same, yeah, it's like you can drop into that space of the painting and the voice of it so easily. Cause sometimes it's hard, like you step away from it, you come back to it. It's hard to get back into the same place. And I definitely have had paintings that feel kind of disjointed to me because I don't have some kind of thread. They're just sprawling weird thing that does and. I'm never sure if it has like a unified 
thing. Whereas sometimes if I am in that space with a certain music or even just the genre, if there's something that can tie it together in my head, helps me stay with that painting in that space. Stay with the thread. Yeah, stay with the thread. <laughs> Do you have any last words of encouragement for anyone out there trying so hard, just trying their best to fold creativity into their daily lives? I feel like it comes back around to that essence of what we were talking about in the beginning. And that's like following your own spark. To me, sometimes it's like I'm making a movement of paint across the painting and it's like the way it, the co- like two colors interact with each other. And it just makes my like heart, it just like lights me up. For me as an artist, as much as I can grab onto those and like follow that path. That's what's led my life in a really creative, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with art. I think it's a way of creatively living where if you find those pieces or things that just make your heart just jump, I don't know if it's their heart jump, but like a full body experience of this feels right. And this feels exciting and you know, that matched with just some believing in yourself and dedication. I think that those, I mean, maybe it's courage, I guess, to just follow that and to not follow what you think you're supposed to be doing, but instead follow what your heart wants to be doing or what you feel like speaks to you. Even if it's just a little thing or a, you're on a hike and you want to sit down and just sit there, that sometimes is the greatest creativity I feel like you can have is to just really listen to the flow of your life. That's awesome. It's like we in our lives are our own creative projects. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) If you'd like to be in touch, email me at afainhouse at gmail.com. If you would like to watch these interviews in video form and are curious about the happenings of my little business called Fane House, where I paint and make art prints and gift cards from my watercolor originals, I'd love for you to sign up for my email list. When you do, you get a coupon for 10% off a one-time purchase in my Etsy shop and first dibs on my annual limited edition calendar printing. You will also be granted access to our free private Facebook group, which is the one spot you can watch these interviews. If this all sounds fun to you, go to your web browser and type bit.ly forward slash Fainhouse to sign up. This is not a weekly newsletter, but rather a list of folks who are interested in hearing from me time to time. You can find this link, as well as links for each person I interview, in the show notes of each episode. Thanks so much to Kelsey for joining us today, and thanks so much to you for listening. I'm Annie Fain Barillon, and I'll leave you with a quote for the day. The aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance, Aristotle. 